All right, I think we're going to begin. Uh, this is our March 9th live stream uh, for San Juan County residents focusing on COVID-19. Um, we're going to be answering a number of questions submitted from the island community. Uh, we probably won't get to all of them, uh, but we will try to answer as many as we can. My name is Brendan Cowan. I'm the Emergency Management Director for both San Juan County and the town of Friday Harbor. Um, I've been doing this for about 17 years, I think, here in the islands. I'm here with Ellen Wilcox. Uh, maybe, Ellen, just talk a little bit about who you are and where you're coming sure. from. Sure. My name is Ellen Wilcox. I'm the Healthy Communities Manager here in San Juan County Health and Community Services. Uh, I am a public health practitioner. I've been working in public health and epidemiology for uh, over 20 years and have been here with San Juan County for five years. Great. Thanks. We're going to be recording this live stream, uh, and it'll be available for watching later for those who can't watch now. Um, you can check the COVID page on the county website for that link. We'll get that up a little bit after this is over. And I think in addition, we'll post it to the County Health and Community Services Facebook page. Uh, so we'll get that link up there. This is our first time doing this uh, ever, um, and even here in the COVID response. Um, we hope it proves useful to the community, uh, but have patience with us as we work through this, because this is our first time. Uh, I promise everyone we'll get better as we, with practice as we do this. But, but I hope it's a good way to communicate some contextual information and kind of get some of the stuff out there to the public that maybe government and the media have been missing or maybe not doing as well a job with as they could. Uh, everywhere, but here in the islands as well. I want to thank everyone who took time to submit questions. Uh, and I want to just take a minute to thank all of the volunteers and agencies and organizations and county staff uh, who've been helping us out in the response uh, for quite some time now. Uh, we received nearly 100 questions. Um, we spent some time trying to group them together into categories. Uh, some of those questions were very similar and got lumped together into a single one. Um, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing this might take between a half an hour and an hour, uh, probably closer to half an hour. Uh, maybe we can begin, Ellen, just by starting with you giving a general sense of things. Uh, where are things at in the islands? Uh, are there any confirmed cases? How many people have been tested? You know, you name it. What, where are we at? So currently in San Juan County, we have no confirmed cases of COVID-19. Uh, we have been working with providers to identify those who have signs and symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19. Uh, those have been tested for other illnesses um, and have not risen to the level of testing for COVID-19. We have have actually gone through uh, one phase of testing with one individual. That test came back negative. And we have another individual uh, in our community who, for whom testing has been ordered, and we will be receiving results in the next few days. Okay, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe we can start with just some general questions um, about COVID and um, <clears throat> just kind of setting the stage a little bit. Uh, what are the symptoms of COVID-19 and who is at risk? Sure. So uh, COVID-19 is actually in a large uh, family of coronaviruses uh, that can range from anything from something as mild as the common cold to something much more extreme like Middle Eastern Respiratory Illness Syndrome or SARS. Um, COVID-19 uh, is, for the majority of people who present with symptoms, they're presenting with a fever, a cough, sometimes difficulty breathing. Uh, those who are most at risk for developing more se severe symptoms and, and those who are uh, not doing well and, and, and dying uh, are those who are over age 60 and also those who have chronic underlying health conditions. They seem to be getting the sickest uh, with uh, novel coronavirus or COVID-19. That said, there's a lot still that we're learning about this virus and, and who it's impacting the most. And we'll be learning that more. The world is learning that because this is a new and novel virus. So that information may change as we understand how it spreads and who it's impacting over time. Okay, thanks. I, just to clarify, and I think we'll get into this probably a little bit later, but not everybody who catches the disease has symptoms. Is that That's right? That's correct. In okay. fact, there are uh, there there's a lot of evidence out there uh, that's uh, demonstrating that there are many people who actually have COVID nineteen who are completely asymptomatic, or there are some who have it and have very very mild symptoms. So it profiles very differently, and we're understanding that and learning that as we go, because again, this is a new and novel virus. Okay, great. Thanks. 
Um, for me, for people out there who are watching, how do we avoid catching the virus? So there's a lot you can do, actually, to minimize your risk of exposure. And, and in, a, in an environment where it seems like there's so much information flooding through and there's not a lot of control, uh, there are, are a lot of things you can do to help uh, protect yourself. The main things are the public health 101 messages. Wash your hands and wash them really well. Wash them properly. We have, um, we have guidance on how to do that on our website. Um, cover your cough. What we do know about this virus is that it's spread through respiratory droplets. So if you're coughing on a surface, someone touches that surface, touches their face, that's a perfect way to transmit this virus. And we can protect ourselves and prevent that. So if you have a cough, cover it uh, with your elbow, not your hand. If you're coughing a lot and you're sick, stay home. Those are the other things. An alcohol-based hand sanitizer also that has a 60 to 95 percent alcohol content also is a good way to really keep your hands clean, when you're, especially when you're going out in public. Okay, that's great. Um, as an individual or a family here in the islands, what should we be doing to prepare and I guess, actually, this is probably a good question for me to answer as the emergency management director, um, because we spend a lot of time talking to the community about how to prepare for emergencies Mm -hmm. and disasters, and uh, there's not been a ton of good news about COVID, but I think one good thing for us is that preparing for it on a larger scale really isn't that different from an earthquake. Um, We know we live in earthquake country. We know we need to be prepared to be on our own for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. You know, we recommend starting with two weeks and maybe building up a bit from there. Um, That's good advice for this as well, and not because because we expect our our grocery stores to be stripped of supplies or a supply chain to collapse but as we'll get into later there's some issues around isolation and quarantine mm-hmm. and it's just it's good practice for people to be to be ready um, and this is a good time to boost up our earthquake preparedness. Um, there are other things like having some medications. If you have medications that you depend on, trying to boost your supply of that. And I recognize that can be difficult, but that's important. Um, and then maybe a big piece, and I mean, this is, this is hard to explain, but it's, it's just about doing the community thing. Taking time to get to check in with your neighbors, understand what your family's needs are, figure out just kind of doing things a little bit maybe more in an old-fashioned way than we're used to in our society and kind of taking care of each other. I think for a lot of us, that's part of what we like about being in the islands. So the more of that sort of thing we do, the better. Um, And chime in here if I'm missing anything important. Um, There's also a question that we have about what is San Juan County? doing to prepare. Mm -hmm. And that's something that both you and I have been involved in quite a bit for some time now. Um, Maybe I'll talk a little bit about the organization, and then you can talk about your work in that organization. Um, For any emergency, whether it be COVID or an earthquake or, you know, a a fire, uh, anything at all, there's a system that we use in the emergency response world to help manage that. Uh, It's called the Incident Command System, and basically just provides a framework for how groups of people who maybe don't work together on an everyday basis come together, coordinate. Um, We try to keep things fairly efficient, fairly structured, fairly streamlined, Um, and it's a way for us to manage fast-moving situations, uh, hopefully smoothly. Um, I've been working in that organization as the public information officer, doing a lot of messaging, and you've been working in that in operations. Mm -hmm. You're the folks who are actually out there doing the work. Maybe talk just a little bit about the work you've been doing as part of that. I think it's up to a 40 or 50 person team now. Uh, yeah, it's it's grown quite a bit. We started with a group of five of us. Uh, when the first case uh, came back positive in Washington State in January, uh, we stood up a very low level response making sure that we were really uh, understanding what was happening globally in the United States and also in Washington State and starting to prepare for what this could look like uh, if, if and when it comes to San Juan County. Uh, that response effort has grown quite a lot and exponentially this week to uh, to over 40 people working on this response. Um, Our primary focus in the operations section is making sure that we're working in it really in lockstep with our provider community, EMS, uh, as well as other agencies uh, who are going to be in that response mode um, on the medical side, on the testing side, uh, answering questions about uh, how are we monitoring any uh, individuals in our county uh, who have have, uh, uh, may have be suspect for COVID or test positive, and how do we keep the risk as low as possible in the public? Uh, Our efforts right now is very clear in our state that we're not going to be able to contain this or stop it. We know the virus is here in Washington State, so our efforts in the operations sections are really on how do we reduce that risk and slow that spread, Mm -hmm. um, especially in San Juan County. And then planning for what happens 
down the road. Lots and uh, lots of planning going on as we anticipate how this could unfold in our county. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Not surprisingly, I think to anyone who's been following this, a lot of the questions we got revolved around testing. And how do we test and who gets tested and how does that all work? So let's dig into that a little bit. Uh, Someone from Orcas Island asked, uh, and actually lots of people asked this question, Mm -hmm. um, is there any place in the islands to get tested um, if you develop symptoms or is that something that you have to go to the mainland to have? So you're right. There's a lot of conversation um, in the media uh, and and information and sometimes misinformation in the media about how to go about getting tested. Uh, For San Juan County residents, uh, the way that you can get tested is to contact your medical provider. If you are symptomatic, if you have signs and symptoms that look very consistent with COVID-19, your provider will work with you to determine whether you should be tested or not. All of those testing orders go through the medical providers. We are not at a point where we have rapid tests rolled out into the community that people can just take home and, and, and do a test uh, on their own. Uh, we might get to that point, and there's a lot of work going on to plan for that you know, in our own operations, but certainly on the federal level as well. But we're not at that point. So the way testing works currently is if you have signs and symptoms or concerns, contact your medical provider, and they will assess whether you should be tested for COVID-19. The way that flows out is um, that testing, the test kits actually are at public health labs or University of Washington labs, and there's a lot of effort and energy being put into making those test kits available at the commercial labs, even as of today, that's starting to be stood up. And what that commercial lab piece means is uh, providers who have contracts already for lab testing for a variety of different illnesses will now have COVID-19 as one of those menu options of tests that they can order for their patient. So there are several avenues. And that that piece is going to really change a lot in the coming days and weeks. And we do have whole sections planning for how that might change to broader community level testing. But at this point, you don't have to go outside of Selmon County to make sure those testing, the the, the tests uh, occur if you're eligible for the test. And I think the, one of the things I'm hearing from you is that there are not test kits that are going to fall into or end up in individual hands mm-hmm. right now. Maybe down the road we could have some sort of a system where they get mailed or mm-hmm. drive through testing or who knows, who knows what. And that might all be great and good ideas. Mm-hmm. But right now the focus is on building capacity in our labs so that our regular healthcare networks can make sure that people are getting tested. And there are good reasons for that. If people are sick and they and they do so show signs of illness, we want them to be consulting with their medical provider. Uh, and their medical provider not only is going to order the tests, but also give them the medical advice that fits their needs based on their symptoms. And that's a really important piece. Okay, that's great. And I mean, just for the community and anyone who's watching, we just want to highlight that if we're missing something or we said something that added to the confusion or didn't make sense to you, just hit us up next time we do this and and refine those questions and and help us continue to kind of make the information useful to to everyone around us. Um, We got several questions from various islands about when and how many testing kits will San Juan County receive, Mm -hmm. how will they be processed, We kind of covered this. Um, We did cover that. Maybe I went a little uh, too much at length into that. But uh, we're we're at a point where we've described that system. Really contact your medical provider. And we're planning for that to all change. One thing we know about this virus, it's new, it's novel. Things are changing very rapidly. And our job is to help get that information out accurately and quickly to the public and providers. Maybe to circle back... We're saying that someone should be symptomatic before they get tested. Mm-hmm. Do we have a way of saying, like, how symptomatic or what those symptoms should be? Or it sounds like maybe that's really done in consultation with your provider. That needs to be done in consultation okay. with the provider. The symptoms tend to, for those who do present symptoms, it's a fever, it's a cough, or shortness of breath. Um, if you have those symptoms, that is the time to contact your medical provider, and they will work with you to determine whether testing is um, ordered or available. Okay, that's great. Mm-hmm. That's super helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of questions in addition to testing about treatment um, and what that looks like for folks. Um, question from Lopez, will we be on our own if we do contra- contract COVID-19, mm-hmm. or will there be medical care available locally for acute cases? That's a great question. Um, currently, there's no actual treatment for COVID-19. There's a lot of work underway globally uh, to find specific antiviral treatments uh, for 
COVID-19. But the main thing to know is the, what we know about this disease so far is 80% of people either have very mild symptoms, maybe moderate symptoms. Some of them have no symptoms. 80% of people can stay home, consult with their health care provider over the phone, um, remain out of the public, reduce the risk of public exposure, uh, and stay in communication with your health care provider, especially if symptoms worsen. Uh, for 20% of people, they do require medical care. And so a lot of our efforts right now with providers and on the planning of this is to make sure that those who are well enough to stay home do stay home, and they are not going out in the community and spreading this further. And what that does is it relieves the health care systems, which are going to be strained and already are strained in a lot of parts of the world, relieves those health care systems or frees them up to deal with the most severe cases, and also those who need to access medical care for all of the other routine reasons that they would be ask, uh, accessing care for, you know, for, for um, pregnancy or childbirth or cancer. So we want to make sure that those who need to access the medical system are not getting more exposed uh, by those who don't necessarily need to be there. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, this is a good question. We got a couple of these. What is the word on getting reinfected? Can you get the virus get better, and then get it again? The word on that is we're still learning. Uh, okay. We don't know the precise answer for that. Uh, and we will learn that because this, this is a new and novel virus. We do have a lot of minds around the world who, and researchers who are studying that. We don't know that yet. So the main thing is if you've got the cur- if you currently have signs and symptoms, you're contacting your health care provider. Okay, that's great. Mm-hmm. This may be a similar answer, um, but are there, is there any proof that this virus spreads asymptomatically? Absolutely, there is okay, proof there is. of that. Okay. Yeah, there's quite a lot of data out there that uh, shows that, uh, that people have contracted the virus but ha- are not uh, symptomatic. And so that, that indicates that there's potentially a much broader community spread element. And the good news about that is it means not everyone is getting very sick with this. The bad news about that is people might be out in the community not realizing uh, that they have COVID and still spreading it. And that impacts our most vulnerable populations the most. And we will you know, we'll share more that uh, as we learn more about that virus, uh, we will share more about what, that, uh, what those mitigations measures can be. Okay. I, I don't um, want to put you on the spot, yeah. but as you say that, I'm wondering, um, and I'm sure other people are wondering, do you have a sense of whether there might be cases in our community now that we're just not aware of? It's it's possible. Okay. It's absolutely possible. And I think that that is part of uh, where we are with, with the spread of this virus, certainly in Washington state and possibly more broadly in our country, other states certainly as well. Uh, we just don't know that yet. But if it were widespread, we'd be seeing more people with symptoms. Presumably. That's, that's true. 20% so that's twenty percent. That's that's a very up. important point. If we uh, if we had widespread community spread of COVID nineteen in San Juan County, we would expect that we would be seeing some very acute, severe cases, and that would signal to us that actually we've got a whole band underneath there who are less symptomatic, uh, and that we've got broad community spread so far. We haven't seen that. It's not to say that couldn't change tomorrow or in two weeks, right. but that's part of the signaling of how, how broadly a virus has taken hold in a community is if you're seeing more and more of those extreme cases, we can make some good assumptions also that there are more who are less symptomatic who also have the disease in the community. Okay. And we're not there yet in San Juan County, and hopefully we don't get there, but we're preparing as if we will. Okay, that's great. Uh, Shifting from treatment a little bit, there were questions Mm -hmm. that we kind of grouped into a category we called exposure, Mm -hmm. um, how the disease is spread and how to avoid it being spread. Mm -hmm. Um, Someone on Orcus asked, uh, what do I do if I start feeling sick? I don't know. Maybe Mm -hmm. this goes back into treatment, but... Well, if you start feeling sick, the, be- the most important thing is to stay at home. We don't want you spreading COVID-19 or any other illness to any other community member. That's how we keep our communities safe. So if you're feeling sick, stay home. And especially now when we know we've got a virus uh, circulating in our state, not any indication that it's in our community yet. Uh, so what can we do to, to uh, make sure that we are not getting people sick and also burdening the health care system? So if you're feeling sick, stay at home, call your provider, and walk through what your signs and symptoms are. And, and the providers in our county are also screening people over the phone. When people have questions and calls, they're not asking them to come right into the medical setting. They're asking them what their signs or symptoms are and triaging from there. So that might look a little bit different uh, to those of you who are used to just getting in to see your provider whenever you have a concern, but these are different times. 
Right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a question um, that popped up a couple times. We talk about quarantine. We talk about isolation. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the difference between those. What does that mean? Yeah, those terms are are, are used very interchangeably. Uh, And there is a difference, actually. Uh, Quarantine is used uh, and uh, recommended when somebody has been exposed to a virus like COVID, uh, but has not yet developed symptoms. And what we ask in those cases is if somebody, if we know that somebody has been exposed, that they stay home for 14 days, uh, monitor for signs and symptoms. Because the last thing we want them to do is know they've been exposed and stay out in the community and potentially Mm -hmm. spread that before they start to show signs or symptoms. Uh, So that's what quarantine is. It's actually asking people who have been exposed but are not sick or not yet sick to stay home until they're out of that window. Um, Isolation is actually uh, used with people who are sick. They do have symptoms and possibly have tested positive for that virus. Uh, In that case, we're asking them also to stay at home and away from others so they're not transmitting or spreading that virus to others. Um, In either case, it's going to mean staying at home, staying out of the public, and that gets back to your point earlier, Brendan, about making sure you're prepared, making sure you've got food on hand in case you find out tomorrow that you've potentially been exposed and we're asking you to stay at home, uh, that you uh, have made arrangements for children, um, pets, um, making sure you've got groceries and medications on hand and the mm-hmm. supplies that really are the same types of preparedness um, sure. uh, activities that we would advise people to do for an earthquake. Let me ask you a question. It didn't pop up in our questions, but just mm-hmm. you talking. Do we have any people in the county right now who are under a request to quarantine or isolate themselves? Uh, we do have uh, one person in the county uh, for whom testing has been ordered. Actually, two people in the county for whom testing has been ordered or we're ruling out other illnesses. And so for those, when, when we are working with the providers, that's a big part of the messaging is until we have this answer, we're asking you to stay home. Right. And then as soon as if we get a negative, then we know mm-hmm. that And then that, 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 that informs things. the next step okay. along the way. And we work very closely with the providers. We have public health staff who are connecting with those families after the providers have seen them to okay. follow up, making sure they don't have any questions, uh, and making sure they get the information that they need to keep themselves safe, their families safe, and the community safe. That's great. That makes sense. A um, whole pile of questions for great reasons uh, makes a lot of sense about schools, potential mm-hmm. closure, all those sorts of things. So mm-hmm. let me just kind of, this one came in from Orcus. Um, why are the schools still operating? Mm-hmm. Shouldn't they be closed? Well, the very short answer to that is we do not have any confirmed cases in San Juan County. Um, and as such, the schools are still operating. Uh, and, and we recognize that that's a, a difficult decision-making point that the schools may find themselves in. Uh, even though we haven't ordered any school closures because we do not have any confirmed cases, uh, we are working very closely. We have a whole task force working very closely with our school and preschool community uh, to make sure that they're prepared for the possibility of schools being closed either for a short term so that they can actually clean the school and reopen or potentially for the long term, depending on what's going on in our community with COVID-19 and whether there's broad community spread. So there's a lot of work going um, on right now with the schools, the Department of Health and our local health department to make sure that we're making those decisions together uh, and that the schools are getting the information they need from the Department of Health and we're getting the information we need from the schools. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, the key part of that that I hear from from you is it's a collaborative effort between the health officer, Absolutely. yourself, the schools. Mm-hmm. The the goal is to be as kind of coordinated, coordinated as, as possible. possible. And, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, that's great. Um, go back just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Next one. Yeah. Okay. Right. This question. Um, when might the schools close? Yeah. I mean, do we have a sense of what the trigger point might be? Or? Well, an, an obvious trigger point would be if there's an exposure that is linked to that school. For instance, there's a staff member or a student uh, who has contracted COVID-19. Um, those would be That would be a, a, certainly a primary point where we would uh, ask a school uh, or recommend that the school closes. It might just be for a few days 
days while the school does some very intensive cleaning procedures and then they reopen. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the school-based risk factor. Um, on a broader level, though, if we find ourselves in a place where we have very broad community spread and we're determining that we are needing to keep more people at home and out of group settings, uh, that might be also a trigger point where the school's entirely closed down based on what's going on with the, de with the disease in our community. But I do want to point out that that's, those are not decisions that we would make lightly, uh, and the schools are not making them lightly. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, certainly pulling kids out of that learning environment has, has consequences for their learning. Um, and certainly pulling kids out of that learning environment and having parents needing to stay home with them has big consequences for their work life in our economy. Uh, so, you know, all of those points are points that are considered at any at any decision making point and we do that collaboratively with our health officer the school district and our public health officials it's not black and white it sounds it's challenging. a lot is not black and white yeah. about covid-19 okay that sounds mm -hmm. great so a lot of questions we took were just mm -hmm. like what is the county doing how does this work mm -hmm. how do we move things people around mm -hmm. um, let's talk just a little bit dig into this just a little bit um, has the county established a, I think this came from San Juan, has the county established a system of taking people off the island mm -hmm. uh, when there's limited bed space at, say, the island, you know, the, the hospital in Friday Harbor or mm -hmm. other facilities? Mm -hmm. What are we looking at in terms of transportation? Yeah, well, a lot of those systems are actually already in place. Uh, so transporta transports happen off-island for a variety of reasons, from our provider setting or hospital setting to the mainland. Uh, so there is, you know, we would be starting with what we already have in place, either with air transport or EMS. Uh, we do have a lot of people working on this exact question, though, and understanding where that tipping point might be, where we need to transport more people off because we don't have necessarily the bed space here. Um, those are really big, valid concerns and, and logistical considerations we need to make. We have a critical access hospital here. It's not a full hospital. It's critical access. Mm -hmm. um, and so those, those um, transportation decisions are... Um, they're going to look similar to what they've been in the past with non-COVID cases when people need to get off the island. Um, another layer to this, though, is that we are doing a lot of work with our uh, colleagues on the mainland uh, to make sure that we actually have places to divert um, patients to if, they, if there is a need for more patient care in the medical setting beyond what we can handle here in the islands. And there's a lot of work being done on that right now, a lot of planning efforts being done um, okay. to anticipate that. I think what I hear is if we're giving anyone out there the impression that we have this all absolutely figured out 100%, that's probably a mistake. <laughs> then we're not on our doing part. a good job with our um, messaging. But I, what I am hearing from you, and I've seen this in action over mm -hmm. the last few weeks, is that these questions are all there are a bunch of people working really hard trying to get good plans in place and working with all the various partners on all the islands. Yep. Um, and that work will continue, um, and we'll keep plugging away at it. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question. Have you considered <laughs> leasing the former convalescent center on San Juan Island or any other facilities mm -hmm. in the islands for isolation and treatment should we need to? Yeah, there are a lot of options on the table, and that is uh, one potential option that we could lean to, and we do. Again, we have a whole task force dedicated to anticipating that need and putting plans together to address that need should we get to that point here in San Juan County. And, I think and our, our health care providers are doing a lot of work planning to be able mm -hmm. to meet the need. Yeah. And I think, you know, if I, my sense from the county side is that if we can support their effort, mm -hmm. we want to do that. We're doing some contingency planning and looking at facilities or other solutions. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not trying to get ahead of anyone in this. We really want to be there to, to support our health care partners as, as, much, we can, as much as we can. Um, this is a great question, I think, and this is true for lots of things that, that we look at in our communities. What can we do for island residents who are unable to afford to stock up for a self-quarantine? Sure. There's also a lot of work underway um, with, with a lot of people thinking through that question. What is that going to look like for students or individuals who are in quarantine or isolation and they might need supplies or resources that they normally would rely on in the community but can't access out in the community. Uh, we are doing a lot of work with uh, local agencies, businesses, resource centers uh, to anticipate what those needs might be and to anticipate how we might need, meet those needs. Not all of the needs necessarily will be able to be met, uh, but we are asking the questions and we are putting a lot of uh, thinking and planning into what resources we have available. We've got a wonderful community 
community, and I do have a lot of confidence and faith that this community can come together uh, when they're asked, and they will do the right thing. And so there might be points that we are making those asks in the community sure. uh, to help those who are most vulnerable uh, to either the disease, but also the impacts of having broad community spread. Right. No, that makes sense. Um, I want to kind of take a minute and go backwards a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about why social distancing Mm -hmm. is so important Mm -hmm. and kind of this concept of like slowing, not stopping, or we've Mm -hmm. heard about flattening the curve? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are wondering about about that. Maybe just briefly talk about that. There are a lot of measures that we can implement and and, and have some control over right now. And we talked about some of those earlier, as simple as washing hands, covering your coughs, stay at home. not shaking hands anymore, but you know, just a, a virtual handshake that can go a long way. Um, limiting or reducing some of your contacts in the public, if you're in a really high risk, vulnerable population, that would be one of them. Social distancing is a big one. Rethinking: Do we really need to meet all of us in a really small room? Could we do a remote option or a conference call option? We're having a lot of those conversations with our routine meetings and stakeholder groups that we, as a public health agency, are used to uh, convening. Uh, we're starting to back down on that and really reassess: Do we? need to have that meeting in person could we do that remotely even at our emergency operations center we're going through some drills in the next couple of days to test our remote uh, call-in options so that we can still meet do the work do the planning together but not necessarily be in close proximity staying six feet away from others is also a really big one to make sure we're not breathing on and touching others and it's not a a place that we necessarily want to be uh, but it's a place that we're finding ourselves right now what about a number of people wrote asking about various events that they're scheduling mm-hmm. and, and should they continue on with mm-hmm. those? Should they cancel? Should they reschedule? Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? I mean, these are not black and white questions, but can you they're talk not. just a little bit about advice you might have yeah, for we folks? Yeah, we can talk generally. Currently, yeah. there are no orders to cancel any mass events or mass convenings or, or close the schools. We are not at that point. But we are asking people to rethink is this really necessary? Is this something that could be postponed? And I've seen a lot in our own community uh, of plans that have been co- postponed, auctions, community gatherings, um, saying, you know what, now might not be the right time. We can do this and still do the good work in a couple of months uh, or next fall. Uh, so I'm starting to see uh, people starting to think that way, plan that way, and, and that also will help slow the spread in our community uh, when and if we have cases here in So just like for County. an individual, there are individual de- decisions. Mm-hmm. There are mm-hmm. lots of variables that go into them, mm-hmm. um, but certainly the more we can do to limit our social contact at this point, the better. That's yep. certainly not bad for us. Um, one of the questions we got a few times was, um, should we close the ferries? Can we somehow mm-hmm. seal the borders of the county and pre- prevent the disease from mm-hmm. coming there? I have some thoughts on that, but mm-hmm. kind of wondering where you're uh, at with there's that. There's really no evidence that that's going to be effective. Uh, okay. and, and, and we have to be very honest about the fact that that is our main mode of transport on and off the island, and there are a lot of people who need to depend on that. It, what, Like we were talking about with closing the schools, that would not be a decision that would ever be made lightly. The thing about the ferries, too, there are very safe ways to get a cross the water on the ferry without exposing yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is just simply staying in your car for that ferry ride. If you need to go and use the restroom, go up, use the restroom, wash your hands really well, use your hand sanitizer that you have in your car, and you're good to go. But closing the ferries down would be a very, very extreme action. We're nowhere close to that. And there's not a lot of evidence that that would actually do a lot of good. I think on the emergency planning side, there are a lot Mm -hmm. of critical supplies, Mm -hmm. you know, food, I mean, all sorts Mm -hmm. of things that we count Mm -hmm. on the the ferries to provide for us. Um, There are a lot of people here who are filling important roles, working at hospitals and schools and other places on the mainland. Mm -hmm. There are people who go for medical treatment that Mm -hmm. they're not going to be able to just put a pause on. And Mm -hmm. so um, I can't imagine a scenario where that would be a likely likely thing we would. It's also our borders here, despite the ferries, are are porous. People have boats and airplanes. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, we're just, I think we'll... We'll move on from that question. It's not a bad question, um, but it, there's no easy way to go about that. Um, 
This is a good one. Does the county have an appropriate stockpile of masks, gowns, gloves, disinfectant to handle the surge of patients Mm -hmm. from this disease? Talk a little bit about how we're handling that. Sure. That's been a big part of our work in the last few weeks is to anticipate what the needs are for supplies like masks, gowns, gloves, disinfectant. We actually started that probably six or seven weeks ago and have really ramped up those efforts. Uh, Just from a basic emergency preparedness and response standpoint, which you're well aware of, Brendan, uh, we do have emergency stockpiles in our county. Uh, But we've also gone the extra measure of assessing what we have and assessing what we think we might need, uh, either with public health or health care providers. But as a county in general, what are those needs going to be? How can we anticipate those? And we have made that request to emergency stockpiles. uh, And I know those requests are happening at the state and federal levels. So that is a big part of our work is preparing and planning for and anticipating needs and making sure we're getting supplies here uh, that we might need. Okay, that's great. I think we got a Few more questions. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of I like this question. It doesn't have an easy answer, but it's a good a good prod for some conversation. How do Islanders best balance the three priorities of keeping the virus spread limited, keeping the economy going, and keeping the healthcare system from being swamped by a number of patients? Thoughts? It's, it is such a balancing act on all all, all of those decision making points. We've been talking with our board of health about. Every decision-making point has consequences either way, uh, and, and a lot of these are very gray areas that we're having to make decisions, but we do need to make the decisions. Uh, we make those decisions based on what we know is happening in our community with this virus and what we know can work to slow that spread. And so we're using the best information in real time at any point to make those decisions. Uh, but we're also very well aware of the fact that if we're talking about people limiting their interaction in public or if we're talking about a measure like closing a school or uh, limiting mass gatherings, that is going to have a very big impact on on our economy. And those are not decisions to be made lightly. Uh, We have uh, our policymakers at the table uh, who are working on that. Um, And then I think the other thing is, again, if you are uh, needing health care, Back to your question about um, not overburdening the healthcare system, call ahead, and if there's a way to be seen or uh, assessed uh, either by phone or, or telehealth, uh, those might be ways that we're going in the, in the coming weeks. Okay, that's great. I think I can talk a little bit. I mean, clearly there are economic impacts mm-hmm. in the county, in the country, mm-hmm. in the world already. Um, mm-hmm. Depending on how this unfolds, those could become quite more significant. Um, so far, much of our work together and as a team has been really focused on the public health response. Mm-hmm. But I know the county over the last few days, going back into last week, has started to think a lot more about what the organization will look like for responding to the economic and the social impacts of this. And there will be a lot of partner agencies from across mm-hmm. the con- across the county involved in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in the next few days, kind of as we head into this week, that effort will be ramping up in coordination with, but somewhat separate from the public health piece. So mm-hmm. I think I know a lot of people out there who are, who are watching are probably wondering about that. I think this may be our last question. Um, I like it. It's good. It's what can we do to help you, i.e. our team, help the community, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, how do Islanders help Islanders, and how do they make our job easier as we're setting out in this? I I think that one of the best things that that our fellow Islanders can do is make sure they're getting good information. They're getting it from trusted resources. We've put a lot of uh, energy into making sure we're getting good information, accurate information out there as we learn it. We don't have all the answers, and we're not going to have all the answers. Uh, That, again, is characteristic of this being a very new and novel uh, virus. Uh, But we we have made the commitment, and we will remain committed to making sure that the information that we get out there is accurate, uh, is useful. If people need different types of information, we're also trying to respond to that Mm -hmm. to make sure that it is as useful and and meaningful as possible. So I'd say making sure that you are actually getting good information and doing the really responsible community-minded things that we've been asking you to do during this last half hour, uh, um, which is taking care of yourself, making sure you're staying at home, you're keeping your kids at home if they're sick, Um, reducing that burden on our health care system so that they are I, freed up is maybe not the right word, but they are able to respond uh, should we have some more uh, severe cases uh, or cases of uh, other illness that, that need a, a medical response. So a lot of it is just being responsible as citizens and, and, and then 
taking a collective part in this. No one of our agencies can do this on our own. Healthcare providers, public health, EMS, none of us can do that on our own. It's going to take a collective community uh, effort to make a collective community impact and to, uh, to really slow that spread. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm getting a note that we've had some connection issues uh, with folks, and I apologize for that. It sounds like high volume maybe is somehow complicated the network. So we'll try to figure out what that was and avoid it for the next time. Um, so thanks for your patience for anyone who's had those issues. And then what I'd say is, again, we will record this and make it available. So mm -hmm. if people had trouble connecting uh, now, then we will mm -hmm. put it up there so you can watch the whole thing down the road a little bit. Um, any other key points that you want to highlight or things you might have missed? And, again, we'll do this again. I mean, I've worked disasters all over the country, the world, hurricanes, tornadoes, fires. This is complicated and challenging in a way that I've never seen before, mm -hmm. just in terms of the uncertainty and the pace and the timing. Mm -hmm. um, so we could probably, I mean, there are questions galore, and we'll do more. Mm -hmm. But anything just in conclusion that you want to? Well, I, th I think you've hit it, Brendan, in terms of this is very complex. There are viruses we know a whole lot more about and we know exactly how to respond to. Um, COVID-19 is a whole different ballgame. We've got o not only the emerging understanding of how this virus spreads, who it impacts the most severely, uh, and we're going to be learning that as we go for months and, and potentially years ahead. Um, added to that is just this overlay of information overload that I think people are probably struggling with. Uh, the guidance changes, the knowledge about how this spreads changes, and it's causing public health to respond and change very quickly, uh, and our providers to respond and change very quickly. And uh, that can be a hard place for people to be, uh, thinking, well, public health doesn't know. Well, you know what? Nobody knows some of the answers to some of these questions, mm -hmm. but we're going to do the best we can to answer the questions and get the answers, uh, knowing that some of that's going to take some time, but there are also some very real practical things we can do that will help this feel a little less out of control, a little uh, more like there's something we can do about it in the interim. We can wash our hands. We can be responsible community-minded citizens, and San Juan County is great at that. So I have full confidence with the, the partnerships that I have seen form just even in the last week, let alone the last month, um, are just impressive, and it is going to be a collective community-minded effort to do the best we can uh, to keep this as low risk as possible. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that, and thanks for mm -hmm. all you and your mm -hmm. team have been doing. Um, just as emergency manager, and, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking and working with communities mm -hmm. in kind of crisis over the years, and um, I just think we're in this place right now where there tend to be two extremes. There's sort of full denial, mm -hmm. and there's full freak out, and there's a happy medium in there of kind of calm, rational, mm -hmm. but concern. Right? There are things we can be doing. There are things we should be doing. I've been talking to a lot of very smart people, yourself included, who tell me that this is something that's a big deal, that we do need to be paying attention to it. It's not just mm -hmm. a bad case of the flu. It has mm -hmm. potential to be much more than that. But there's also so much uncertainty that, that we don't know for sure. So I just think we in the county need to try to help keep our community as comfortably nestled in that middle spot as we can be, where we're taking it seriously, we're doing everything we can, mm -hmm. um, but we also have time to, like, take care of ourselves and each other and kind of do the island things that we, that kind of brought most of us here in the first place. Absolutely. So, um, I really want to thank everyone uh, for listening to us. Uh, hopefully we shared some information that's useful. I would encourage folks to go to the Health and Community Services uh, Facebook page after we post the recording and share your feedback. I mean, I think we would love to know, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure it won't always be pretty, but hopefully hopefully some of what we did was useful. And let us know if you appreciate this. Did you watch? Do you have questions, um, ideas for topics for the future? And we'll kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, we won't respond to every request, obviously, but we will listen and read that. And that's a good way for us to get a sense of how valuable this was in kind of the immediate term. So mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ellen, uh, and appreciate everyone who helped us put this together. So take care.